All right, George Frederick Whitworth. I don't think he wore a bow tie more than once or twice in his life, but one of those days was the one he posed for this picture. He was an outdoor guy. He was a Northwest adventurer. Now, he came a little later than some of the people we've looked at, and I guarantee you he didn't do most of his work wearing a bow tie, but that's probably the most famous picture we have of him, and so it's the one I'm going to use for the time being. He was a Presbyterian minister in Indiana. He was an early pioneer, especially to the Puget Sound area. He's probably most famous in his time for being a church planter. These were Presbyterian churches, by the way. So he was about the business of starting churches. That was his vision. That was his appointment, really, within the missionary board in which he served. He has sometimes been called the father of Presbyterianism in the state of Washington, and I think the title is rightly deserved. He was, for a time, the president of the Territorial University of Washington, which you know of better as the University of Washington, so he was an original Husky. And he also was the founder of the school that bears his name, now known as Whitworth University, although when it began it was called Sumner Academy. We'll see that a little bit later. But aside from all of that, he was a lawyer, he practiced law off and on. He was involved in Indian affairs within this region. He was a farmer. He was very important in the early development of coal resources in the Pacific Northwest. And all of these were activities that he sort of carried on simultaneously. He was a multitasker on steroids, you know. He just could do it all and all at the same time. Clarence Bagley wrote a book entitled The History of Seattle. And in it, he says this of Whitworth. Probably no resident of Washington has left so deep an impress upon public affairs of so wide a range. And I think it's probably a correct assessment, and it speaks to what a remarkable character he was. He was Presbyterian right down to his toenails. He was Presbyterian all the way through. I don't apologize for that. We're Presbyterians, and we're happy to see these characters who come along and do great things, partly in service to the Presbyterian tradition. He was born in England in Land, uh, Lincolnshire in 1816. He immigrated with his parents to Ohio when he was 12 years old. And so they came to America when he was still a boy. He learned a practical trade from his father who was an expert harness maker. And so that was the skill that George Whitworth developed in his early teenage years. But he also had an academic bent, and that was always part of what inspired him. He went to college, graduated from Hanover College, and about that time married his wife, uh, Mary Thompson. This was in 1838. She was from a family of Presbyterian ministers, and so they had a very Presbyterian marriage. They moved to Lancaster, Ohio, and for a time George became a high school principal. This didn't last too long, but it did plant a seed in his mind. I think he realized what a strategic moment it is in the development of a young person, those high school years, what we would call high school years. And that's why the original Whitworth University was actually a high school, because that was what he wanted to do, was reach young people at that very strategic moment and shape them in a direction not only of Christian education, but of Christian conscience and character, and he thought the high school years were the optimum moment to do that. So this was an important moment, though it didn't, take, uh, it didn't last too long. On the side, he picked up a law degree, and so he became a practicing lawyer as well, and this was in Indiana and Ohio, and then in his spare time, he went to seminary and got a degree from New Albany Theological Seminary in Indiana. All of this kind of rolls together, you know, the guy was always doing a lot of stuff all at once. But in 1847, the year of the Whitman Massacre, he graduated from seminary and at least for a time was an ordained Presbyterian minister serving several churches but never for too long. He was kind of an interim for a period of time in the late 1840s. He had Presbyterian roots, he had a Presbyterian vision. The Presbyterian vision had to do with the Pacific Northwest. Even as a boy back in England, he had been fascinated with the Pacific Northwest. 
he had studied and in fact devoured accounts of the life of David Thompson. We of course considered David Thompson some weeks back. He was aware of the Northwest Company, he was aware of the Hudson Bay Company, and he was, even as a boy, just devouring everything he could about that wild place of adventure and had many uh, a time that he would sort of envision being out there himself. When he was a young adult here in America, he still considered and explored uh, the uh, adventures of the people, especially the Presbyterians that we've looked at who were involved out here. He was very much aware of the Whitmans, the Spaldings, Cushing Eels, Elkana Walker and others. So he was always thinking about this and he had a design he actually planned or thought or tried to imagine how you could create a Presbyterian colony. Does that sound nice? A Presbyterian colony. We, at the early part of the 20th, 21st century in America, probably think that's an odd sounding phrase. We think, wait a minute, what about church and state and all of that? We need to understand that in the middle of the 19th century in America, our notion of separation of church and state looked very, very different. We have evolved radically, and I'm not sure in a healthy way over the years in our understanding of that constitutional principle, which is in fact really not in the Constitution at all, but that's another story. Uh, and uh, so anyway, he conceived of a colony in which Presbyterian philosophy would be at the very roots of how this colony conceived of its existence and its civil order and its educational uh, approaches and strategies. So that was kind of what was in his head. Here's a man, young man, middle of the 19th century, and he wants to invent a Presbyterian colony. And he wrote an article to defend that idea. It was published in 1852. It was published in a magazine called the Presbyterian Magazine. Catchy. <laughs> and in that magazine edition, he wrote this article including the following. Quote, it is intended that we shall establish a good parochial school for the benefit of the children and youth of the colony. And no efforts will be spared to elevate the character of the school and to make it an institution of learning of the highest grade. In other words, education was at the core of his whole vision of what this colony would be about. He continued, it shall be a settled principle that no child or youth connected with the colony shall ever be permitted to grow up without the benefit of a good English education and a thorough religious training. Whitworth was about a robust, well-rounded, broad education, not simply in Christian truth, which was certainly at the core of it and kind of the stabilizing center of it, but would reach out to all legitimate areas of human learning. So that was his vision and he wanted a colony where that sort of thing would be made readily available. That article sparked quite a bit of interest and after it had sort of uh, hit the bloodstream of Presbyterians around the eastern part of the country, no less than 50 families signed up to become part of this adventure to establish a Presbyterian colony in the Pacific Northwest. Of the 50 families, precisely zero made it. So along with his roots and vision, George Whitworth had a bit of stamina as well because he had to put up with some at least significant disappointments along the way. Most of those who originally were filled with a kind of rush of excitement about the whole idea were put off a bit by things like the Whitman Massacre and diseases and Indian fears otherwise, you know, and so on. All of these things became somewhat significant impediments and so a lot of people lost their original uh, interest and enthusiasm in the face of those deterrents. When he actually was ready to launch this uh, excursion to the Pacific Northwest, there were only two families that joined him, and about halfway through the trip, both of them went other directions as well. So Whitworth wound up with just his immediate family, um, and uh, they 
uh, started this westward trek. It was George, his wife. It was by this time their four children. It was two nieces who came along. Mary's mother came along, who was 70 years old, undaunted by the uh, uh, prospects of the uh, challenges here. And then there were two single men who came with them. So that was their little tribe that set off uh, in a small wagon train toward the Pacific Northwest following the Oregon Trail. George Whitworth was a Presbyterian, and in those days it meant you were a Sabbath keeper. Uh, we've sort of lost that uh, vision, at least to some degree, in more modern times, but at that time it was considered almost rudimentary to a Christian life that you would observe the Sabbath in a very distinct way, a day of rest, a day of charitable labors, etc., but not of any ordinary work. And that was exactly what George did at the beginning of the trip. But the closer they got to Indian territory, the more he was willing to bend the rules, you know. And so by the time they were really coming through this part of the country, they were traveling every day and making as good a time as they could. So he was willing to be a little bit of a compromise, or if he needed to, for in the face of practical uh, challenges. He was a good journal keeper. His journals are masterly at understatement. He made this comment about the, the uh, trip out to the Northwest in general. He said it was in no wise remarkable. And then he goes ahead and describes along the way some of the things they dealt with. The usual Oregon Trail problems like weather, straying or sick cattle, difficult river crossings, mosquitoes, Indian alarms, and illnesses. But it was not unusual, you know. No deaths among the Whitworth party from disease, accidents, or Indians. So they arrived in the fall of 1853. George Whitworth came out under the Presbytery Mission Board. So he was coming as an appointee and officially as a missionary. He arrived in 53. They settled originally in Portland and he immediately went to work establishing a Presbyterian church there. So the first church that he actually planted in the Pacific Northwest was First Presbyterian Church of Portland, Oregon, which continues, of course, to operate to this day. He didn't remain in Portland for too long. That very same year, they moved north of Olympia to a, a few miles, and George Whitworth filed a claim under the Donation Land Act, which I, of course, have spoken of, you recall, quite disparagingly in recent weeks because it had a frankly racist component to it, which I think is uh, inexcusable. I'm happy to say George was not doing anything in this land claim that he made that would have had any sort of racial hostility involved in it. It would happen to be the uh, standard uh, means whereby settlement could take place and land claims would occur. But anyway, that's what he did. 320 acres came under his control, a little region north of Olympia. His main activity, however, and, uh, and along with that, was being an active churchman and, of course, a missionary in this region. And most of what he was doing was planting churches. Probably the church that is the most famous church that he planted was First Presbyterian Church of Seattle. And I'm just going to give you a little footnote on this, a little trivia on that church, just because I think it's interesting. Uh, this church was planted by George in 1869. I'm kind of telling his story thematically rather than chronologically because he's doing all this stuff at the same time, you know, and so it's hard to kind of go through a chronological sequence. But one of the churches he planted, this was 1869, was uh, First Press of Seattle. Originally it had seven charter members, six women, one man. The church was under his pastorate, uh, pastoral care for a couple of years, no more than that, and then it kind of took on a life of its own. They moved into their own building in 1877, and in 1894, they built a new building again, which could house 1,500 people. The 11th minister who came in right about the turn of the century was a man by the name of Dr. Mark Matthews. This was when Whitworth was still alive, but uh, he was kind of nearing the uh, end of his life. Mark Matthews took on the church. He was the pastor there for 38 years, and under his rather extraordinary preaching. He was one of the best known preachers in the Pacific Northwest at the time. The church grew from 1,000 in 1903 to 8,000 in 1940, making it the largest Presbyterian church in the world. And so Seattle